How, how are you, Graham? I'm very good, Terry. Good to see you as well, Steve. I'm good to see you. Good to finally meet you. I've heard a lot about you, and I've read quite a bit about you as well. <laughs> really? Well, I don't know who's been writing that. Probably me. <laughs> <laughs> probably you, yeah. yeah. That's all good stuff. It probably is. It's an excellent website that you've got for information about yourself. I feel as though I've been chatting to you for hours. I've just been watching a few of your your clips. One you're talking okay. to uh, Don, Don Johnson. Don, Don, Don Johnson? Dom Jolly, rather. Dom Jolly, yeah. Jolly. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah, he was good, wasn't he? He was. How about really that? It. He went to the same school as Osama bin Laden. Yeah, yeah, that was um, <laughs> I was thinking, I was trying to work out the ages. Then he said he, he went 10 years previously. Yeah. Yeah, he wasn't. He doesn't remember him, and he was. I think he was eleven, and Bin Laden was like fifteen or something. He yeah. was, but uh, yeah, this was in. Was it Yemen? It was in the Middle East. Yeah, yeah, I think so. Yeah, and it was a Quaker school, <laughs> of all things. Yeah, yeah. They didn't want yeah to and he tells a great story. He, he tells does. a great story about it. Yeah, about yeah. when he he was making a documentary and he met the, I think she was the headmistress or something. And she said, what are you doing here? And, and he said, oh, we're making this documentary about where I grew up. And uh, and she said, well, well, why are you here? And he said, well, I think I'm probably one of your most famous alumni. <laughs> and she said, no, we had Osama bin Laden. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, I think I'd claim Dom Jolly over Osama bin Laden if it was my school. Mind you, Osama bin Laden could well have gone to my school. He probably would have been the <laughs> one of the less violent kids. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Was that in Liverpool or was that when you were over in New Zealand, was it? No, that was Penketh High School. So do you know Great Sankey and Penketh? Uh, about Warrington. 15 yeah. miles. Yeah, it, about, about, it's like three miles the Liverpool side of, uh, of Warrington. Yeah, it's 15 miles from Liverpool, but it might as well be on another planet. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I was, when I was born, we lived in Egberth, but we left when I was two, as, as a lot of people did. They moved out. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah, and you went to uh, emigrated, didn't you? Then to uh, was it New Zealand or Australia? Australia, wasn't it? Yeah, yeah. Well, when I was eighteen, my parents emigrated to New Zealand. So that was oh, me, right, my sister, yeah. and my mum and dad, and we were there for well till I was twenty-one, and then my parents and my sister said, "Oh, we're going to go home back to Britain," and I said, "Well, I kind of like it here. I'm going to stay." So. I was 21, so I never actually left home. I was abandoned on the other side of the world. Yeah. Uh, that was my experience. I waved my parents off um, uh, as they got on a plane and, the, and they came back to Britain. And then, uh, yeah, then I was on my own. And, and uh, that's when things really started to change for me. And uh, well, that's how you got into radio, isn't it? In Australia. By in Australia, yeah. By radio and uh, going, I can do that. Yeah. Yeah, Yoss, a lot Yossa of people Hughes, do. Was that? A Hughes moment was that? It was, yeah, it gives a job. It really <laughs> was. Uh, I was uh, I was an air conditioning engineer in Sydney, and I was working in mainly high-rise buildings, which meant at the end of the day, every day, I was in thick Sydney traffic trying to get home. We lived on the North Shore, a place called Wollstonecraft. And, you know, uh, I was listening to the radio, and, and the particular station I was listening to, I figured that the bloke listening to it was so out of touch with all these people in this traffic. I mean, they were doing traffic reports, but they were, they were just like in another, it was just, it wasn't connecting, I thought. And by the time I got home, I was so annoyed. And I said to my wife, I said, you know, I, I've worked out what I want to do. I, I want to be on the radio. And I was 27, which for radio is actually quite late. Most yeah, people yeah. are in their teens yeah. at hospital radio stations. I was 27 and had never, although I had briefly been on Radio City, I came home for a holiday in 84. We went in 83. I came back for a holiday at Christmas 84. And my cousin Victoria, they lived in Walton, and she was really into a DJ on Radio City called Nicky Brown. Nicky Brown on 194, I don't remember. He, he did a nighttime show. And she was uh, really into him. And yeah. Somehow she'd arranged for us to go into Stanley Street where Radio City was, and yeah. they recorded a piece with me because I was over from New Zealand. A, a very short piece. And then they ran it on the show that night. So my actual radio debut was on Radio City. <laughs> Believe it or not. In yeah. Stanley Street before In they Stanley moved Street, to yeah. up the tower, yeah. 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 Wow. Yeah. But, yeah, I, 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 I got into radio in, in Australia. I started out, uh, yeah. I uh, I did a course. For, for the, the, you know, 
a lot of broken down, failed disc jockeys run broadcasting courses as they do here. <laughs> and uh, you go to a community center and a bloke teaches you how to read a commercial and a weather forecast and spend six weeks doing that and charges you money. So after that, it was, but it was called the Sydney Broadcasting Academy. Wow. And you get a certificate. And with my certificate, I went to a, a community radio station called 2 Triple R in Sydney, which I thought stood for rock and roll radio. It actually stood for Ride Regional Radio. It was uh, uh, the area of, of Sydney called uh, Ride. And, uh, and they, made, they made me do a course as well. So I did their course. And at the end of their course, I said, look, you know, I'm ready to go on the air. They said, we have to wait for a slot. So I got out their schedule. And it turned out that they were off the air between 2 a.m. and 6 a.m. Sunday mornings. They shut down like on a Saturday night, Sunday morning. I said, I'll go in there. And so I went in there for about a year and, and had no listeners and didn't get paid. But I had total freedom because none of the bosses were listening or anything. And, <laughs> yeah, yeah. and the, the desk was, you know, it was rotary controls rather than uh, sliders. Just, and yeah. they didn't even have a phone connected through. So because I was an air conditioning engineer, I had my van out in the car park while the songs were on. I wired up a phone extension into the studio from the office phone and I bought a speaker phone and I plugged it in to the extension I'd wired in. And I got the guest mic and jammed that in the speaker of the speaker phone. And I'm taking callers, you know, um, and, and like somebody caught it one night and said, because in the morning I'd pack it all up and, and take it yeah, all away with yeah, me. Yeah. They were like, how did you do that? And I'm like, oh, you know, when you know what you do. And they couldn't work. No, I don't think anybody worked out how I was doing phonons. <laughs> it was because I'd wired it up while the songs were playing. Yeah. Brilliant. Okay, great. Can, can I ask about other work? Uh, you're, you're an award-winning um, international broadcaster, but you, you've, you've completed, you've produced over 100 audio books. Which yeah, I've got about 120 on sale now. Wow. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. Is that your main bread and butter now these days or you still That's doing any it. broadcasting yeah what happened was i was i was running fix radio in london in fact i, I was on merseyside on sunday mornings and i packed I that, that in yeah. to to concentrate on this this job i got in london because i thought this is going to be a big commitment i'm running a london radio station albeit a niche one fix radio is for builders and uh, i ran that for a few years so we went to new zealand to visit julie's parents and whatever while we were there bloody pandemic kicked off didn't it and we had a hard time getting back we managed to get a flight back via singapore i think we got the last flight into singapore before they stopped taking flights in yeah. and uh, we got back to the uk and it was like we we're in a zombie apocalypse it was like we we're in a parallel yeah. universe so all these meetings i had um jacked up with radio stations bbc and commercial they cancelled them all so you know any interviews you know i think i had about six different meetings set up to you know to to get my next radio job and nobody wanted to talk to me and it was pandemic so what can you do so i had to work out how i could earn a living from home and i'd heard about audio books so i just went online and i went on websites that where authors post their books and uh, you audition for them and i thought i'll try anything so i auditioned for um three audio books i thought that'll just get me started and i got one of them yeah. and i couldn't believe it i thought i'd have to audition you know i've never done it before yeah. an audio book and these were the one i got was a fiction audio book it was about um british soldiers in in india during the empire kind of turn of the century 18 yeah. well i don't even know when it was 18 yeah. whatever it was when we had you know soldiers in india and so it was all the different characters of all the different soldiers you know, S Scotsmen and Irishmen and Cockneys and Geordies and Scousers and Yorkshiremen and, you know, the whole thing. So I had to do all these different voices and then the officers were all posh. And so, but I did it and it was about a, I think it was about like nine hours long, this Oof, thing. That's a big one. Uh, but, but I did it and I actually really quite enjoyed it because yeah. it's just play acting and all yeah. the prep's done. You've, all the words are written. Yeah. Whereas in radio, usually you show up and you've got to yeah. put a show together. Yeah. So I'm thinking, yeah. well, hang on, it's already written for me. All I've got to do is interpret it. Yeah. And the better authors, it's much easier because you can, whatever they write, it's there on the page what yeah. the character's like. Yeah. And they often say, you know, he's a Scotsman or whatever, whatever he is. And so I had fun with that. And so I auditioned for another three and got another one. And then I just gradually built it up. Now, I didn't have a proper studio at the time i did 
the first 50 books out of the wardrobe. Really? <laughs> what, what, yeah. what I've read is that you need sort of very high specification sound system, mixing systems and top of the range microphone. And Well, I started out, I spent, I spent a decent amount of money. I spent about 400 quid on the microphone. That was the biggest expense. Yeah. But I wanted, because I live on a main road oh. uh, and I'm in a wardrobe, so it's not a fully soundproofed area. I wanted, I, I, and I knew nothing about micro. I'd worked all these years in radio and I'd seen microphones and I'd seen names like Neumann and Shaw and whatever, but I didn't have a clue about microphones. Mm. And so I started learning about microphones and, and basically I found out there are two different types. There's a condenser microphone and a dynamic. Now I'd been in bands, so but, but they, I knew they weren't special stage mics. I knew they were different to studio mics. Anyway, he said, knocking the mic. Um, so. <laughs> I, I wanted a, I found out that um, dynamic mics are less sensitive than condenser mics. Condenser mics, if you've ever listened to a radio station, maybe a talk station, and they're doing an interview, and you can hear the presenter's chair squeaking, and you can hear them clicking the mouse while the guest's answering the question, that's because they're using a condenser mic. They're very, very sensitive. A dynamic mic isn't as sensitive. And I found out that the most, the one that everyone was using on podcasts is, is one, it looks like a, it's about the shape of a, of a Red Bull can and they're black and it's called a Shure, is it 7B? SM7B, yeah. pretty sure that's what it's called. And they were using that one and everyone was using that to make podcasts because they weren't, they were very forgiving to badly treated spaces. So they would be very forgiving on, on echo and reflection and also road, road noise and whatever. So I spent about 400 quid on the microphone the, the um, interface I used the, was about a hundred quid. And that was it. I plugged it into my computer. That was it. I bought some foam, you know, this kind of stuff. Yeah, soundproof. Uh, I put that all through the, uh, well, that's the other thing I had to learn. This is sound treatment, not what? soundproof. Soundproof, you need density, you need thickness, like concrete and, and thick, but this this is sound treatment. This stops yeah. the echo, it stops reflection. I had to learn all this from scratch, even though I'd been in radio all those years. Yeah, yeah so then I decked the wardrobe out. So for, a, for about <laughs> 500 quid, these are any cheap, so maybe 550 quid, yeah. I was in the game. Um, but I didn't have a choice at that stage. Uh, it was that or starve. Yeah. Um, and, but it, it really did take off quite quickly and as i say the first 50 books did in the wardrobe and then i bought this which is a a, a purpose built and they build it to to your measurements and everything so i've got it so that the computer is a, the reason why you're looking down at me slightly yeah. is i've set it so that the computer here is at eye level when i read the script off okay. the off the screen i got it exactly how i want it and it's a meter wide by a meter and a half long it's still only small but it was like six grand Wow. But wow, wow, it made a do yeah. But oh no, but I easily, I'd easily made that much from the books. Yeah. I mean, I was <laughs> doing great. Um, and so it was time to to upgrade, and then I upgraded the mic. This is still a dynamic mic, but this is an even more expensive. It's a better one, in my opinion. It's the ones we used to use in Australia. It's a Electro Voice RE20, which is American Sounds great. mic. Sounds great. Yeah, and so uh, I I gradually upgraded, and I bought um I bought a Rodecaster Pro now. The the uh, the mixing desk, mixer. you know, the one. Yeah. So yeah, then that was mainly for doing radio work, like all the great British radio and podcasts, because it's got all the, you know, all the sound effects and stuff. It's got all that on it, you know, for, well, I was doing a chart show at number one, you know, so, um, yeah, so, so I needed that, but that's, that, that's probably, yeah. So, so that's probably another 400. So, but we're not talking, you know, to get into audio books, basically you really only need, if you wanted to go really cheap, you can do it with a USB mic and, and people do yeah. it with like a hundred quid USB mic plugged into the computer. You yeah. don't really need because you're not, you're not putting the sound effects and the music beds and Very stuff true, in. Yeah. Yeah. You're just reading it. It's uh, it's all in making sure you, you edit it and then you have to, but it's all 12 year old kids on YouTube show you exactly how to, yeah. to master it to audible.com spec because okay. they're pretty fussy. You have yep. to get it exactly right to their spec. But once you've got that down, yeah. it's uh, it's so much fun, audio books. Well, yeah. I've read on their official website that they reckon it takes something like 10 hours of, of work to get one hour of production. I think some right, people, I, I would say some, some people must take that long. 
I don't take anywhere near that long. I can, I can, if it's a straight read, like a business book yeah. or a uh, how to, what have I done? Things like how to break your cell phone addiction, or if it's just a straight read, one voice, no characters, yeah. I could do an hour in, in under two hours. Oh. Yeah. So I could do quite a few hours in a day. Yeah. Uh, and the thing is you get, for, for most of the ones I've done, you get paid per finished hour. So the quicker wow. you can do an hour, yeah. the higher your hourly rate is Brilliant. in effect. Yeah. Because, yeah. yeah. But if I'm doing one that's got a lot of characters... Like Cocky, so you've done Cocky recently, haven't you, about Curtis Warren? Now, that one, that was, that's a great book. Yeah, that I did. One, yeah, yeah, that good. one should have been quite straightforward. However, there are although it's not a fiction book, it's true, there's a lot of characters in it. So there's all the different police that are chasing him, there's all his gangland mates and all his other the other crims that he hangs Talk, out with. Talking in backslang things. Talking in backslang, that's in there, yeah. And so you have to you have to get that right and you have to it's no good having one scouse accent. You've got to have about fifteen because there's all the different cops and all his mates. But then the story moves to Holland. So then you've got to do a bit of Dutch, and Dutch is probably <laughs> my real week suit. <laughs> but you'll do that. But it, then there's Colombia, there's Colombians mm. in it. And, and um, you know, it goes all over the world. So there's a lot more accents in it than you would have thought. Yeah. Um, but yeah, it was good fun, that book. It was, it was, it was really good. The ones that, that will really slow me down <laughs> is when there's a lot of phone conversations in it. And not all narrators do this, but when I've got a phone conversation, I always make one side of the phone conversation sound like they're on the phone. I put a filter on the, uh, when I'm mastering oh. it. Yeah. so that it sounds like somebody's on a phone it's yeah. just uh, through um through audacity like the the, the software i use is audacity is free i that's don't free, even use it? Adobe yeah. Adobe. Audacity. I, yeah. I use yeah. that because it's free yeah <laughs> yeah well that's you know i've done 120 audiobooks on on free software wow. literally if you wanted wow. to get going in audiobooks if you've already got a computer which most people have you just need a usb mic that's it audacity is free yeah. So you could yeah. probably get going for a hundred quid and you don't need these. You can use uh, pillows, coats, anything soft to stop your wardrobe echoing. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, a, con a continental quilt rounder. Yeah, it's all it needs. Carpet's yeah. good. Yeah. yeah. Wow. You know, when you, when, you, when you do a fiction book, uh, do you have to speak to the authors beforehand to get a lot of background on the characters so you can get the feel for it? Or do you just take it completely out of the book? It depends if some of them, if they've only got a few characters and it's really obvious, I'll just go for it. But the thing is, you do the first 15 minutes first and send it to the author and the uh, author right. will then go, nah, or, or, or they'll go spot on or they'll go, can you make this character a bit meaner or can you make them a bit smarter or can you make them, you know, so you, you get a bit of feedback from that. But I don't usually talk to the authors until the book's done when i interview them on youtube that's usually the first time i've actually spoken to them face to face and we've had a conversation up until then it's all email so i've got it all in writing what they say because if it starts going bad you know you can end up with doing like 10 hours worth of work and not get paid if you oh, if you mess it up you know yeah, what i mean yeah. so you, i like to have everything in writing yeah. but i usually i usually send them you're supposed to do the first 15 minutes and then when they okay that, you do the rest of the book. But what I like to do, I do the first 15 minutes. I then send them the first hour and then I send them in two hour chunks because if I'm mispronouncing a place name or a person's name and the authors are all over the world and, wow. you know, the Americans have weird pronunciations of English words, yeah. you know. So uh, I try to do that so we pick anything up early and, I can, and then I don't keep making the same mistake again and again. Yeah. My, my book's out as an audio book. It came out about two years ago. But the yeah. Irish narrator, I sent a list of, you know, phonetic spellings, like places like Heighton in Liverpool. Yeah, yeah. He pronounced it. And, so Tommy went to Hooton. He said, it's not Hooton. And places like Chilwell Valley Road. It's Childwall Valley Road. But it should be Childwell. Yeah. And, but uh, I, I let it go. <laughs> you let it go. You could have asked him to do it again. I, don't I know, know, but it was a royalty share job. And, oh, was it? Yeah. So I didn't want to push too much. Yeah, did it sell all right? It sold one or two. I think I think the grand total of about <laughs> forty five, I think, over the past what, three oh, years. Well he, well he didn't make that much money out of it anyway, I did know, he? I know. So you know <laughs> But you know what, that we're talking to you, I'm thinking of having to go myself. 
I was, yeah, when, you I, might as when, well. when I first looked it up, I was just put off with the high specification and saying you need this thousand pound microphone and this no. massive well, studio you, and it, it depends. <laughs> I mean, if you if you've if you've got a reasonably quiet space, the the space is actually more important than the mic. If you've got a really good, nice, quiet space with no echo, it's completely flat, then even even a stage mic, even like a Shure SM58 or an SM57 stage mic that, you know, the SM58 is the mic that everybody use, all singers use on stage. Yeah. That one, I mean, they're only like, they're, they're only about, I think they're only about 80 quid. Yeah. You know, you, you, that would all, but, but, you know, you could do it with a, um, a Yeti mic, which is what, about 100 quid plug in on a USB. They are condenser mics though, so they'll be sensitive. Yeah. So if, it, if you wanted to, but an interface which will allow you to use any mic, they're only about a hundred quid. Yeah. So yeah, you don't, the mic, you don't need a really, really high end mic because once you've mastered them and then they become MP3s, then once you upload them to Audible, Audible compress them as well. Okay. So yeah. it doesn't, if it was too high quality, yeah. it wouldn't, that high quality wouldn't translate. You know what I mean? Cause they're yeah, only going to be an MP3 yeah. and they've been compressed about three times on the way up anyway. Yeah. yeah. So, I mean, it's, you, you can't do it with just the mic on your headphones. Like that's yeah. not going to cut it. Yeah. Yeah. But as long as it's a decent enough mic, it doesn't have to be anything super duper. It really doesn't have to be like a, a as I've learned the Neumann TLM 107, which is what you think or 103. TLM 103, I think it is, the one that's in most radio stations, certainly in Radio Merseyside, yeah. you don't need one of them. I mean, because they're like 700 quid. You certainly don't need anything that good because you're not broadcasting over FM and DAB. Yeah. You're going to MP3 and it's being compressed to shit and then pushed up the stick. So uh, you don't need it for audio books. It doesn't. And you've just got you've just got your voice. It's not like there's a lot of other stuff going on that has to cut through. It's just your voice. Yeah. So you really don't need it to be that that special you know i did the first few that i did with royalty share you know i didn't know how to pick them and i was picking things that didn't sell and i was doing stuff and not making any money so then i switched to per finished hour and i gradually put my finished hour rate up and up and up and up and now it's more than twice what i started it at and the royalty share things i'm i'm picking some of them and i get a really nice royalty check every month before i've done any work at all Brilliant. from the from the ones that i've done but only about i've only done about 20 percent of the books i've done have been yeah. royalty share but you've got to be careful with that because you can if they don't sell yeah you're in yeah. trouble you know cx is pretty good though because they go on audible they go on whatever Apple's books Amazon are called these well. days, yeah. and they go on Amazon. Well, they're the biggest in the world. True. You know what I mean? So, yeah. you know, if, if, it's, if it doesn't sell on them, you're wasting your time anyway. Yeah. 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 Terry was uh, telling me a few years ago, I didn't hear this, but you did um, a brilliant oh, uh, yeah. broadcast on Radio Merseyside about airport luggage getting mixed up and sent to the wrong locations. You did a bit of a skit on it. Can you remember that? that? Did you rehearse it, or was it off the cuff, or...? It's well, years it ago. was, it was definitely written because because stuff like that I used to write so that it always had somewhere to go. So I had a punchline, and I forget right. the punchline okay. to it. Yeah. But what I remembered, it was just it was something to do with like these bags and bags yeah, yeah, and these it, bags and these yeah. bags yeah, and these yeah, bags yeah. and these. And then the bags never end. You know, I think I was thinking I was sympathising <laughs> with the baggage handlers who were, there was some dispute. It was like, I, I, no wonder they go, you know, ballistic. Imagine that. It's just just these bags they just keep coming at you. These bags, uh, but I can't remember the punchline. I don't know if you can remember it. <laughs> No, I, I think it, it was would have had one because I always yeah. put some kind of button on the end somewhere I, for it to go. I remember it, it reminded me of something like out of Catch 22. There's a scene in that book uh, yeah. where Jose Arian, he's trying to get somebody to take over his, his, his flights. Well, actually, he's not trying to get them to take over, but he makes it so complicated that nobody wants it. And he's saying, <laughs> no, like the, the nails go to Wales, the, the poo right. goes to Cameroon. You no, know, just well, rhyme. There was something like that, isn't yeah, there? There was, yeah. A, yeah, there wasn't I saying there was like a, a rhyme somewhere. Yeah, there was something like I can't remember. There's a something goes to Afghanistan or something goes to Japan and yeah, the yeah. Isle of Man. And the, yeah, and, that, yeah, yeah. That, that's right. Yeah, it was bag. Uh, this bag goes here and that goes uh, uh, And it just kept ramping up and ramping up. And it, I forget what it was in the, uh, what the punchline was. I don't even think I've kept that bit, you know. It was I brilliant, you know. I, I remember pulling it over, listening, and laughing. That was, that was quality. <laughs> that was great. That, <laughs> that kind of thing. That kind of thing is what really got me going. And you know, when I was ten years old, like way before I was in radio, because I was an air conditioning engineer and I worked on a construction site. I was a pipe fitter for three years, an oil refinery construction when I was in New Zealand. 
Um, it was when I was 10 years old, my dad bought me a second, it was my, actually my 10th birthday, my dad bought me a second hand reel to reel tape recorder. Like when, when I was 10 years old, everybody had cassettes except me, I had a reel to reel. And um, there was a button on it called superimpose. And what you could do is you could record something, then you could rewind it, and then you could record something over on another track. The only thing was you couldn't hear what was on the original track. And I think now, now you probably had to plug a set of headphones in to make to, to hear the other track. But anyway, and my birthday's in June, so the Trooping of the Colour was on TV, and you know, I was 10 years old, I was recording everything. I was recording stuff off the TV by holding the mic up to the speaker. So my dad said, well, what have you got there? I said, I've recorded the marching bands from the Trooping of the Colour. He goes, oh, give us it here. So he rewound it after these marching bands and he starts doing his own commentary he pushes this superimposed button and he goes and there is the queen he goes and as is traditional on these occasions she is sitting side saddle and he goes um uh, oh oh my goodness the queen she's fallen off her horse oh and prince philip's helping her up. oh and he's pushed her over the other side <laughs> and he did this and then he rewound it and played it back so you could hear the trooping of the color in the background i think yeah. that was like it was you i mean to say my mind was blown was an understatement because <laughs> up until that point, one and one was always two. Uh, yeah. But yeah. now one and one could be whatever you wanted whatever it to be. <laughs> you know, that's what radio is. And so Magic. always that kind of thing. So then when I did get into cassettes and whatever, and I remember when I first moved to New Zealand, when I was 18, all my mates were back in, uh, in Warrington. I was um, uh, sending cassettes home rather than letters. You know, so I was doing sketches and I was interviewing people in the pub and Kiwis and whatever. And uh, so I was always, although I didn't get into radio till I was 20, so I was always into, you know, that kind of thing is writing little things and making stuff up and, mm. and all that and, and recording things and using sounds and yeah, yeah always doing that. Yeah. Yeah. Can I ask you a link with that? You said writing stuff. You've done so many novels now, so many sort of well, reference type of books. You know, have you ever thought of writing your own novel, your own story? Yeah, I've got. One day, I suppose I will, because I think I've had an interesting time. Um, you know, I've lived in three countries, yeah. uh, albeit, though, they're not that exotic. They're New Zealand, Australia and the UK. It's not like I lived in Borneo for three <laughs> years. Or but, you know, and, and getting into radio and working in radio, and I've met lots of uh, interesting people in and out of radio and uh, you know I met some interesting people on a on that construction site because mm. there's people from all over the world on that job um, so yeah maybe one day but uh, yeah recently I had an idea and I ran it faster than author I don't even know it's a good idea for a fiction you know I think I think I could write a reasonable biography but I think I got an idea for a fiction book now anyone can have ideas you got to actually write what do they yeah. say like they say um, people teachers who teach write are, yeah but the one i like is they say people who who write are writers and people who wait are waiters you know, so oh, yeah. right now i'm waiting to write but you know so it's it's inexcusable well, I, I got an idea for something which would be um you ever see the the the, the series on netflix called the lincoln lawyer yeah i've That's seen it yeah. the idea. right yeah well yeah. It, it, right M michael this connelly is, character isn't it well this is um where I got well an idea I think I could nick in that in the first episode of the Lincoln lawyer he's got a mate who's a lawyer who gets shot and he kind of inherits the lawyer's oh, yeah. business Practice. so he has to take on all the cases yeah. right so although well, maybe my idea is like so you've got someone who's an audiobook narrator that's what he does right but his brother is like really successful you know, in the Metropolitan Police and he solves all the big murders in London and, and all the rest of it. And he ends up being a private investigator when he retires from the police force. Maybe something goes wrong, he gets kicked out of the police force. I don't know. Maybe something like that. But then his brother dies and leaves him the private investigation business. And now he's got to solve all these crimes. Yeah. And the way he does it is by talking to all these authors all over the world who've got these amazing imaginations oh, yeah. <laughs> to yeah. say, I don't know, maybe that could, I don't know whether that, that could be great. something that's, or not. That's, that's I don't superb. know. It's a fiction book. I don't, I, I don't know. It's it's maybe somebody watching or listening will nick that. Well, oh, know, please, so. <laughs> if you actually go and write it, it's good for you. Because yeah, I don't know if I'll ever get around it. Do you want to edit that out? No, no, leave it in. Leave it in. I'll probably never get around to it. 
Uh, we'll uh, just go- just diversifying slightly. Yeah, uh, can you tell us a little bit about your band? Great, is oh, it yeah. Graham Mac Blues Band? I've been in a few bands over the years. Um, the first successful band I was in was in New Zealand when I was 22. And what what how that happened was uh, I had some mates who were musicians and I always sang. And I had some mates who were musicians who were they were, they were more into, you know, new wave and stuff. But um, there was a hairdresser's ball at the Forum North in Whangarei, New Zealand. And they were doing a like a lip remember when lip syncing was a big deal in the 80s oh, and they had contests yeah. for lip syncing they were doing some so they had a tina turner and i think they had an elvis and they had whatever and they didn't have a beatles and they wanted a beatles and i my hair used to be like that and <laughs> and uh and whatever and i said well we'll do a beatles but i'm not miming i'll sing live well they said well, we're not miming either we'll play live because the guitar players and drummers and bass players and stuff so we put this four piece together and we just did a thing as the Beatles and we did a couple of tunes and it went it went really really well and one of the uh, salesmen from the local radio station who had sponsored the event said if you put a band together I'll manage you and we thought wow guy from the radio station or managers we've all got a manager so we, we put a set list together of 60s tunes so we did like Beatles stones kinks searches swinging blue jeans you know all those 60s beat groups and we we called ourselves Liverpool Direct and the trick was none of the others who were all Kiwis were allowed to speak on the mic only I was allowed to speak on the mic now we weren't saying we were direct from Liverpool but the name of the band was (laughs) Liverpool Direct but that went that went really well and that went for a couple of years And then we all fell out, uh, as young lads do. And then I got married. And then after that, there was a there was a band in in this town, Whangarei, where I, where I lived. And well, actually, Northland, the region of New Zealand, they were the best band. They'd been going for years. They were called the Misfits, and they'd had lineup changes and whatever. And they were the best band in town. And two of them used to back up a guy called Tom Sharplin, who had a band called Tom Sharplin and the Cadillacs. And they were like a big Auckland band and they were a big deal. But uh, Steve Shaw and Les uh, Neil used to play in that band and whatever. And I, we, Tom Sharplin and the Cadillacs, me and my wife went to see them and uh, in, when they came to Whangarei and, and they played and they were great. And uh, so I get a call one night from, from one of them and they said, oh, you know, our, our lead singer's gone to jail. I forget what for. <laughs> they said, would you like to be the new lead singer in the Misfits? And wow, this is the top band in town. And yeah. I was in the Misfits for about four years before I left New Zealand, went to Australia. And that, that was really, we were playing three nights a week here, there and everywhere, staying in motels. And uh, there was one particular motel that run by a bloke called Boris in Kaitaia. And it was always great, the Collards Tavern. And that was, that was a lot of fun. And we were doing like 60s and stuff. And there was a TV show called Call of Duty was a big deal. So they do like Paint It, Paint it Black was a big uh, tune from that. And uh, um, We Gotta Get Out of This Place by The Animals was a big tune from that TV show. So we used to do all the, all the songs that were on those soundtracks because it, it was just happening. And then in 1990, I went to Australia and worked as air conditioning engineer. Got out of music altogether. I thought, you know, well, I've had my fun with it and, and I've enjoyed it. But then in 2005, I was running, I was the program director at 2CR in Bournemouth and we were, the radio station was running a Battle of the Bands competition and, you know, I was talking to the musicians and I was seeing the, the gear and the amps and these Fender and Gibson and, the, you know, you get into all anoraki and you think, oh, I want to So I thought, I always fancied a blues band. I always fancied, you know, you know, I've always done 60s, so I always fancied a blues band, do some Muddy Waters and Howlin' Wolf and Robert Johnson and that kind of stuff. So I found some musicians to back me up and we just called it the Graham Mac Blues Band and we, we went really, really well. We did we, we, like we, we did all sorts of things all over uh, Dorset and Hampshire. Um, always had loads of work as well as 
as well as being the program director at the radio station and doing the breakfast show of the <laughs> radio busy, busy station. Life. Very busy life. Busy, busy, yeah. yeah. But I made, I made it busy for myself because I was in Nottingham when I got hired because I, I, like, invented the job. I'd, I mean, I, 2CR was the first UK radio station I worked at when I went, I went in 97. And um, I'd, I'd left there in 98. I was only there for 18 months and I'd worked everywhere. BRNB, I was there for three years and uh, I'd been up to Teesside and... Uh, Anyway, so I was in Nottingham. I was at Century Radio in Nottingham. And um, I was on a two-year deal, and I knew they weren't going to renew it because I was on silly money because they'd hired me from BRMB, and I was on stupid money there. And so for them to get me to go, they'd, it was still capital, but they'd, they paid off the difference. It was just stupid. And, I, and I, I, so I just rang them up, and I said, uh, I said, I hear you, you need a program director in Bournemouth. And he said, yeah. I said, well, I'd like to apply. And he said, oh, well, let's talk. And I said, yeah, but you know what? I said, um, I'm only going to go if I can also do breakfast. And he said, okay, we might be able to do that. And I said, I'll tell you what as well, Dirk, I want two paychecks. <laughs> I'm doing two jobs. Yeah. So I had a great, I had a great, I had a great down there. So that was how that band came about. But then I had, um, years later when I was in Swindon, um, I interviewed the chief executive of Swindon Borough Council. And doing BBC local radio, all speech, totally different to commercial, because when you've got a guest on, you've got to challenge them and hold them to account, especially the, the people from the council. And this guy was the chief executive. He's on a six-figure sum with the council. And they're, uh, they're laying off council workers. Yeah. And I can't remember. I, I'm, I, I'd hate to say this, but it, yeah. it felt to me like they'd just given themselves a rise or something. Oh. Anyway, so I interviewed him and I mullered him. I mean, yeah. I took him apart. It was so much fun about how much money he was making and how yeah. these you know, people who were sweeping the roads, you know, are getting laid off and all the rest of it. Really gave it to him. But in my research, I found out that he was a lead guitarist, played blues rock. Yeah. So what at the end of the interview, he's like thinking, oh, you know, I'm out of here. I said, oh, there's just one more thing, you know, like Columbo. Yeah. And I pulled out electric <laughs> guitar from under the bench and an amp, and I plugged it in and I said, it says here that you fancy yourself as a bit of a guitar player. I said, well, I've been in many bands. Let's see what you got. So <laughs> live on the air on BBC Wheelchair, he started, and he was really good. And at the end of it, I said, oh, we got to form a band now. <laughs> so we formed Graham Mac Rock Band. Because it's BBC, though, we did it all for charity. So we didn't make all the money we made, and we didn't book gigs. We always, if there was a gig that was on, we would go and support whoever was on. So we weren't taking work off local musicians and we weren't making all the money that we did make went to charity. I think we, I can't remember the figure. I, I, in my mind, it's like it was over a hundred grand, but it, wow. who knows, it, it, it was uh, the exact figure. It was a lot of money yeah. that we raised for local charities in Swindon. We got a bass player and a drummer with that and that, that worked out great. That was Graham Mack rock band. And that was, we were doing he much heavier stuff than the blues stuff. Yeah. yeah so. Yeah, but I'm not doing anything at the moment with the music. Yeah, big commitment. The music, much more so than yeah. radio. So no plans for touring then. <laughs> no, I would like to get into it. Again. I'd love to get into like, um, you know, have you ever heard like the the Hamburg tapes of the Beatles from yeah. that Star Raw, Club Raw. recording? Yeah. So that yeah. that I mean, it's so badly recorded, but you know, like that. I'd love to put a band together that just does that, you know, like, you know, the old Chuck Berry things at really high tempo and, yeah. you know, um, some of the guy and all that, like the cavern and the, and that, but like, do it like full on, you know, like make the, make the Ramon songs look like ballads, you know, like, just, oh, yeah. I'd love to do something really <laughs> heavy like that. If I could find the right people who are into it, that'd be fun. Mm. Yeah. Have you, have you seen the film, The Backbeat, based on yeah, the Yeah, like there. that. That'd be great. Yeah. We talked to Scott Williams. He, he played, uh, not Ringo. Uh, what's the drummer's name, the previous drummer for Ringo? Oh, Pete. Pete, Pete, yeah. Pete, Best. Pete, Pete Best. I've yeah. met him. I met yeah. him in Radio Merseyside once, oh, yeah. actually. Yeah. 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 Oh, Graham, just going back to your, the Audible books. Yeah. Maybe, maybe, maybe a final question from me. If you had yeah. a choice of any work of fiction, in fact, any book at all, you had the yeah. choice to, for an author to knock on your door and say, can you do the narration and the production of this book? What would you choose? Well, I'd choose something I'm into. I wouldn't be able to give you just one. You yeah. see, because the thing is, the difference between being like an amateur and a pro, if you're an amateur, you're going to do the stuff that appeals to you. When you're a pro, you have to do anything. So like I've done that. I've done everything from romance through to nonfiction to whatever. I've done 
I've done religious books and I'm an atheist. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you have your fingers crossed. <laughs> In fact, I auditioned. I, I'm not joking. Funny, I auditioned today. I don't know if I'll get it. I auditioned yeah. today for the Quran in English. What? Yeah. I'm not joking. Oh, my um, word. Oh. But I'll, so, so I always think as an audiobook narrator, I'm a pro. Yeah. You give it to me and I'll have a bash at it. You, if, I'll give yeah. you an audition for anything. Yeah. So, but, but if I was, if I could choose, well, I'd love to do a book about, uh, LFC, you know, I'd love to do oh. one on Shankly. I'd love yeah. to do a Bob Paisley oh, book, yeah, yeah. a Kenny yeah. Dalglish book would be lovely. Yeah. Even a Robbie Fowler, any, any of the players, any of the yeah. players would be yeah. a, a biography would be great. Um, I'd love to do a book about the Beatles or any one of the Beatles or the Beatles story. You know, I've done two books based in Liverpool. Cocky was one, which was yeah. fabulous, a really good experience. I also did another one called The Memorabilia Man, which is a fiction book about uh, gangsters and cops and stuff set in Liverpool. And that's a lot of fun as well. Yeah. So, yeah, just anything that I'm into like that, either the Beatles or, you know, music or something like that. A okay. Shank if I had to pick one, maybe say a Shankly book, I think okay. would probably be great to do. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Live Any thoughts of uh, going on a decent drama series or a soap or has anybody ever approached you no because all of the acting i've done has been uh audio acting not not on screen uh, well I, I played the goat on some tv commercials in australia for a car dealers in a supermarket i did <laughs> did quite a lot of them have you seen any of them they're on youtube they're awful did you say play um, the goat then is that an expression oh no i yeah, I no, I was just. It, I mean, the way it started, I was on the breakfast show on Fiverr C in Mount Gambia, yeah. and in Australia you have a lot of live commercials, a lot of live copy, especially for supermarkets. And the supermarkets, it's item price, so you go. And today, cat food is on special at ninety six. You know, it's really boring. So I always used to, when I was on the radio, try as a little challenge. If there's something that I thought was boring, like we used to have to do the funeral announcements in parks and 2PK parks on the air every morning. Wow. Yeah, this is, yeah. And I think the only people that listened were to see if they woke up to see if they were dead. But oh. anyway, <laughs> uh, it was a legal requirement. If you didn't have a daily local paper and parks didn't have a daily local paper, the Champion Post came out one day and then there's another town not far away, Forbes, and it was alternate days. So, so you had to have funeral announcements. But we did, uh, we used to do hog hog prices and, and stock prices of, for farmers and in the breakfast show and anyway i used to do this live copy for the supermarket item price so i used to mess about with it and i used to go like you know toilet roll is on special and remember the, this stuff is number one for number twos and i used to do just mess about with them well one day the phone goes in the studio and it's the hotline and i'm thinking it's the boss and it's the manager of the supermarket has been given the hotline number. And he says, uh, yeah, mate. I said, yeah, he says, uh, yeah, I've been listening to you do my commercials. And I'm like, oh, Christ, I'm going to get sacked. He <laughs> says, uh, yeah, could you do that on TV? And uh, I said, well, I don't know. So we go down the supermarket and we do two 30 second spots. And I, he'd give me the, he, no script. He would give me the items on special that week. I'd hold them up to the camera, make the stupid joke about them. And uh, then they were TVs. This week's specials from Foster's Foodland, Fitless Foodland, and Foodland Compton Street. Number 12 chickens are just $3.99 each. And they've got heaps of them, not just a poultry amount. Hey, look at this. Bunches of broccoli, just 99 cents each. Kids won't eat it, but it's really cheap. It's 79 cents for a 500 gram bag of these. They're what drunken Eskimos have all the time. Frozen peas. Porterhouse steak is $6.99 a kilo, and there's cooking instructions in case you've forgotten how to cook steak. Three kilogram bag of navel oranges are $1.98. And look, they're all innies. You know, I reckon I could get one of these on two wheels. Hey, look, I've got it, I've got it. Eh, no, I haven't got it. Eh. Fitness Foodland, Foster's Foodland, and Foodland Compton Street. But then there's a car dealer. The, the, the supermarket was called Foodland. There was a car dealer called Carlin and Gazard. They sold second-hand cars. He rings me up and he goes, oh, I've been watching those TV commercials you've had on Channel 8. And I said, oh, yeah. He says, could you do that with cars? And I went, I don't know. So we went down there. We stood in the car dealership. Yeah. And it's going like, yeah. just stand in front of the car. And he said, well, tell me something about the car so I can mention it. And he'd go, oh, well, it's got keyless entry. And I'd go, OK, got it. I'd go, now this one is how many miles and whatever. It says, this one's got keyless entry. Where I come from, we used to use a brick. And, and, <laughs> and, 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 um, and I do, there was one, I remember one, it said, I said, tell me about it. He said, it's got a driver's side airbag. I said, OK. I said, I've got it, right. So we did it. And I said, and this one, it's got this many miles and it costs this many dollars and whatever. And it's got a driver's side airbag. There's 
there's no airbag on the passenger side, but hey, why do we care? The passenger won't be making the payments. And, like, <laughs> and so that all took off. And then I found um, an old video that what the guy, Mr. The old man Gazard's son was a stunt driver. And he drove this car on its side on two wheels through the dealership, past all these cars that they were selling. And th they, they used to run that at the tail of the commercials. And I said, uh, show me what, and, and they showed me an, uh, some other video of it. And there was one where the car fell over. And I said, oh, that's hilarious. You've got to show that. He said, oh, no, Mark would never, never let us show that, can't I? I said, well, let's pretend I'm in the car. So then we shot another bit of me getting in the car, <laughs> going like this, and, and then the car goes over and whatever. So then when I'm doing the supermarket ones, I've got the trolley on its side. Oh. <laughs> and so with this whole series of... Um, oh so I was on breakfast radio in the morning, and I was on the telly every night in these TV commercials, and it really... I mean, if you want your ratings to go through the roof, see if you can get a deal like that. That's yeah. great, yeah. So that, <laughs> that's... Uh... Hello, it's me again with some more great specials, but this time I'm at Carland, C&G's Carland, and they've got Ford lasers, seven of these. This one's the Gear, which is the posh model, and it's only 15,490. The current model EF Falcon is here right now, ready for you to take away. This one's only done 700 kilometers. It's even got a driver's side airbag. There's none on the passenger side, but hey, they won't be making the payments. C&G's Carland's got some great specials on Volvos. This is the one with leather, electric everything. This one's cheap at six grand. And this one, some people think that Volvos are boring. Well, this 84 is 9990 and it's fun. And you don't have to be a school teacher. Here's another low kilometer bargain at C&G's Carland. This little shopping trolley is only $16.95 a kilo. It's me again at C&G's Carland. Now this SE Magna is a 93. It's got all the extras on it, even cruise control. It's only $21,990. Now when you're down here, remember, you kick the tire and talk to the salesman, not the other way around. Down here, they've got three seekers. This one's Judith Durham. Hey, hello, here comes Peter with that car on two wheels. Eric, my helmet. I'm going to have a go at that. That's the, that's the closest I've got to acting on the telly. Yeah. <laughs> well, look, did you really enjoy it, though? You must have really enjoyed it by the sounds of it. Yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. They're all on YouTube. Um, yeah, they're they're, oh, they're awful because I've got, like, really bad hair, and uh, it's just awful. I was, yeah. Are they on your channel on YouTube? Yeah, I haven't. I, I don't. Think, I had a brief glance around earlier, but didn't didn't come to these. Type I of don't videos. think I've got them on the website because I'm too embarrassed. Uh, so uh, you'd okay. have to get them through the YouTube. If you just put Graham Mac commercial, Australia oh, okay. commercial, uh, I was on f Channel Eight. SES Channel Eight was the TV station. SES Channel Eight. What I'll do, S Graham, yeah. I'm going to put yeah. a link to all these things at the end of this. When oh, I edit, great! I did it out tomorrow. So yeah, no, there. they're true. <laughs> they're truly terrible commercials. You got to remember, there was no script. Yeah. And, you know, we used to make like, we used to make two 30, two 30 second commercials in an hour, which is yeah. unheard of in television. Wow. Like, it just can't be done. It's just like the yeah. TV crew loved it. They just showed up and off they went, you know, yeah. not worry about anything. Awesome. That, that sounds like the TV crew when they Better Call Saul. I don't know if you've, you've heard of it or you watch any of that. Yeah, yeah. Well, I haven't watched the, the later one. I watched the first, I mean, I watched Breaking Bad all the way yeah. through and then I watched the first I think it was the first couple of seasons of Better Call Saul, but I haven't got back to it. To, to, to see it goes on for 40 it. years, I think. Oh, 40. right. Well, wow. <laughs> it feels like sometimes. <laughs> no, but it's come to the finale now. He's just come to the point now where he's, he is the character in Breaking Bad. Okay. He has become he Saul. Right, I see. Yeah, yeah. 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 Well, Graham, I think um, at that, that time's caught up with us, but it's been an absolute delight chatting with you. I've really enjoyed it. It's been fun talking to you too. I hope it's... everything goes well. I hope you've got plenty of stuff you can use. Oh, it's it's more been than extremely enough. entertaining. I think so, yeah. <laughs> it's really good. Yeah, <laughs> yeah we've we got more than me. Yeah, than me. I, we asked for Graham, which we really appreciate. Oh, that's great. All right. Well, thanks for thinking of me. And uh, if you if you do want to do some audio books and you get stuck, send me an email and I'll, I'll give you a few few tricks or i wish i'd have talked to you three years ago i really do <laughs> yeah i mean i had to work it all out from i made a lot of mistakes but hey i got i, I got them there and now i'm not i haven't looked back it's just been so good i really really do enjoy it it's mm. even even today today all i did today i, did, I worked on 
And I worked on two books this morning and all afternoon I just did a load of auditions and a, a lot of people, they, they hate doing auditions, but I really like them because I'll do stuff, you know, like doing the English version of the Quran because it said it wanted a <laughs> Middle Eastern accent. So it like, the Can Quran is the word of God and I like just have so much fun getting into the character and I, I might need, I'll wonder. probably not even get the job, but it doesn't matter. I had good, a good time auditioning for it that, you know, and if you can enjoy yeah. every aspect of your job, you True. know, you're laughing, yeah. aren't you? Yeah, definitely. Yeah. That's a gift really absolutely. is. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, but, but for now we'll, we'll say thanks. And uh, you take care, Graham. Let's keep in touch, mate. Yeah, definitely. Thanks very much. <laughs> oh, thanks, Graham. Cheers, Graham. Thanks. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.